very much for asking me to speak today. And I would like to spend the next um, 15 minutes really just taking you on the mitochondrial donation odyssey that has been here in the United Kingdom and share some of our experiences about implementing such technologies into clinical practice. So what I'd like to do or start with is actually take you right back to 2015 when we actually had legislative change. And I'm going to just show a short video, um, which just is a synopsis of, of what happened then. The United Kingdom is set to become the first country in the world to introduce legislation allowing the creation of human embryos from the DNA of three people. This is a bold step for Parliament to take but it is a considered and informed step. The first babies with three genetic parents could be born in Britain as soon as next year. It offers hope to families affected by a wide range of diseases caused by faulty genes passed from mother to child. Describing mitochondrial donation as producing GM babies, or indeed three parent babies, are phrases that are wildly misleading. It's not fair that if there's a scientific technique out there that could resolve this happening and stop this happening in the future, that we're not using it. We're sitting there with a, a technique that could potentially prevent the transmission of these diseases. Mitochondrial disease is an inherited disorder that affects around one in every 6,000 babies. Could help about 150 couples each year who are at risk of passing on certain genetic diseases. It's aimed at stopping infants from being born with inherited diseases. The new method would take genetic material from a mother, a father and from a donor woman with the aim of preventing deadly diseases being passed on to the child. It would just be incredible. It, it, it is like a light at the end of the tunnel for them. Her children would also inherit the disease unless MPs vote to allow a controversial technique to change the genetic material she passes on. The mitochondrial disease is, is just horrific. It, the, way it, the way that it affects children and it shortens lives and the suffering that, that children and adults have to go through. I think this is a, a, an important advancement in medicine to allow women to have healthy children. I think we have to be really clear that there is currently no cure and no treatment for mitochondrial disorders. Mm. It's debilitating, it's cruel, and, and families and parents have to watch their children die. The eyes to the right, 382. The nose to the left, 128. <laughs> So that was 2015. So where have we come since then? Um, and as you can imagine, you know, that most of us remember where we were that day, not just the patients, but ourselves internationally. But since then, a lot of work has gone on behind the scenes to implement um, this kind of technique, these kind of technologies into clinical practice with the hope of reducing transmission to the next generation. So since 2015, within the first two years, a lot of work had to be done before we could even apply for potential licenses for patients um, to uh, potentially use such technologies because of additional work that was requested by our authoritative body, the HFEA. Since then, we had to then work or devise how we would actually implement this into our current um, practice within the NHS. We know that approximately one in 4,300 people are affected with mitochondrial disorders and perhaps up to one in 200 babies are potential risk of developing mitochondrial disease. Here within the United Kingdom, we have the NHS, which um, spans Scotland, Wales, England and Northern Ireland. And we had to devise a service um, through our highly commissionized service, which is one of three centres here in Newcastle, Oxford and London. Um, how we would uh, set up a service to provide reproductive option choices to women who harbour pathogenic mtDNA mutations. So this was going to obviously be quite complex because there's nothing of this anywhere internationally. We wanted a very rigorous regulated framework. Um, and also what we wanted is not just to look at how mitochondrial donation might be implemented within the NHS, but also actually how we could devise a pathway so that women were better informed about all the reproductive options and choices and to also invite their partners along to those discussions. So we had to look at devising an integrated care pathway that would involve the holistic care of the mother, the potential baby, um, and because of mitochondrial donation and the way it is, also the donor. 
So how would this start? We had to devise a, uh, a referral pathway. And within that, we've devised a performer. So what we do before any person comes to our clinic is that we gather all the clinical information uh, around their genetic diagnosis, around how they're clinically affected, what specialists are involved, because you can imagine this is really a team effort of care. We also look at the family tree and the family pedigree because that gives us valuable information around how this family is affected by this form of mitochondrial disease. Because I'm sure you're aware how even a, a one mutation affects an individual can be very different within a family and between families. So before anyone even comes to Newcastle, we have had several meetings reviewing their cases, and we bring a team of experts together from the laboratory, from the clinical service, from nursing care and psychologists to discuss um, this patient. We've devised a very stringent care pathway for these patients, which involves things from around the risk of inheritance, so very specific to the form of mitochondrial disease they have. But actually, we've also had to look at things like the complications of pregnancy, we look at the reproductive health, we go through the reproductive options, we look at maternal health throughout pregnancy and also their psychology review. When the couple come along to our clinic, they're met usually by our nurse consultant and myself. And the first part of the pathway is very much around the care of that potential expectant mother. And perhaps one of the biggest lessons I think we have learned as we have um, you know, uh, worked through this different pathway and looked at the care is these women that are coming forward themselves are quite often affected by mitochondrial disease. And whilst a lot of the focus perhaps at the outset when we were devising this pathway is to discuss the potential options they may have, it was becoming increasingly evident that we had several things that needed to change within even our care pathway and how we looked at these clinical allocation spots. The first thing we also noticed is education. Quite often coming into the clinic, the partners of our women perhaps hadn't um, had as much information or knowledge around mitochondrial disease. So the first thing we do is talk about mitochondria, their importance around producing energy, looking at things, you know, around diet and how that can also impact uh, on these women's health and well-being, but very much right back to the basics with no assumptions around mitochondria and what their knowledge base may be. The next thing we do is talk about the complexity of mitochondrial disease, and this is quite often extremely personalized to the couple because we talk about holistically around mitochondrial disease and how varied it might be. But then obviously they come along quite often with a genetic diagnosis and we talk them through the implications of that and their options are very much based around what that form of mitochondrial disease or which I often refer to is like a spelling mistake within their genetic material of why that potentially may have occurred and why um, that has implications for both them and their future health as well as that of potential children. When we talk about mitochondrial donation, we're talking specifically about the form of inheritance where the mutation is passed down the maternal family line. And if we go back to biology, that's because in the creation of the embryo, you've got the egg and the sperm. And when they fuse, most of the mitochondria are in the tail of the sperm, and that's discarded when this fuses. Therefore, and any uh, paternal mitochondria that comes across is, is effectively destroyed by um, the, the female egg. That's the basic science of why you don't inherit your um, father's mitochondria. It doesn't mean men can't be affected, but they cannot pass it on to the next generation. So not only do they come and talk about the potential implications of what mitochondria can do and when things go wrong, faulty mitochondria and the potential inheritance, we also reconfirm the genetic diagnosis. So we make sure that that uh, genetic diagnosis is, has been affirmed in an accredited laboratory here in Newcastle. And quite often we take three tissues. So we take a mouth swab, a urine sample and a blood sample. And that's not just to confirm 
the genetic diagnosis, but that gives us an idea of the level of faulty mitochondria across three different tissues. And obviously we can't go in and look at the eggs per se of every individual coming in, but it gives us an idea of the potential spread in that woman's eggs. And why is that important? Well, as I said previously, it not only gives us an idea about her fitness for fertility, but it is informs us on how we advise that couple on their reproductive options. The first premise is also around fitness for fertility. As I've alluded to, quite often these women themselves have serious forms of mitochondrial disease. And as the clinic has developed over the last couple of years, um, our mitochondrial support team and our specialists feeding into that service has significantly grown. Currently only mitochondrial donation can um, be uh, assessed and provided from Newcastle. But actually these women come, as I suggested, all from over the United Kingdom. We link throughout uh, the country to their specialists. Quite often they may have heart involvement. So there is an important um, role for cardiologists. Uh, their gut may be involved. So their gastrointestinal specialist. Uh, we may also have the brain may be involved by seizures and their epilepsy specialist or ourselves as neurologists are involved, diabetologists involved, because the aspects around that care of that woman is extremely important. And as I say, we, what we try and do is ensure they're as fit as possible. We do the usual conventional therapies for women here, where that we commence vitamin D immediately and folic acid before they start the consideration of um, moving towards pregnancy. And at the, the same time, we ensure that it is clinician led care because we do have GP and nurse led care here, but it's very much we have. Um, that it's obstetric led care here because of the complexities, not just around their mitochondrial disease, but then the potential impact on physiological changes that come with pregnancy. We know in several forms of mitochondrial disease that there increased incidence of complications in pregnancy, such as preeclampsia or uncontrolled high blood pressure, which have significant implications, not just for mummy, but for baby. We know that gestational diabetes, so development of diabetes during pregnancy is significantly increased in several forms of mitochondrial disease. So what we do is we better monitor and more closely monitor throughout pregnancy. I would suggest that these little devices that monitor blood sugars have revolutionized, so things like the Libra device, have revolutionized our care, particularly over the last two years um, of these women. And other aspects, if you think about by the time most women may realize that they're pregnant, that their, their um, blood circulation is significantly and their heart output is significantly impacted. And that in itself for anybody who is potentially heart involvement may be somewhat significant. So a lot of our pathway and care has actually changed to involve the care of the woman herself. There are several options that may be available, natural pregnancy where they conceive naturally and they may test the baby inside the womb. And that's really only available to women where we think their eggs are very low levels. They may opt for egg donation and that's where another woman um, provides an egg. We remove the lady's eggs who harbors very high mutation levels um, and fertilize that egg with the, um, their partner's sperm legally emotionally that baby's theirs but for women who would like to be genetically related to their children there's pgd and that's where we take um uh, we fertilize several eggs from the woman and we test each egg and that an embryo and with the lowest level we transplant that back into that lady again um, and that can be extremely successful particularly in women where we uh, suspect we will have low levels of the faulty mutation in her eggs. And I would suggest, again, since the development of our new clinical service, we've seen an exponential doubling in the number of women who we have successfully put, um, put through on the PGD pathway. And then there's mitochondrial donation itself. And the complexity of this um, is very much dependent on, obviously, the suitability of PNT in the United Kingdom, only women who um, are not suitable for PGD and who have a serious form of mitochondrial disease are currently licensed for mitochondrial donation. And that's where we take a donor's egg, 
uh, the patient's eggs, we fertilize both eggs, we remove the nuclear material from the donor egg, as well as from the lady who's got mitochondrial disease, we discard her faulty mitochondria and transplant her nuclear or chromosomal material transplanted into the donor egg and hopefully minimize the carryover of faulty mitochondria so that in that developing embryo, uh, there is a significant reduction of faulty mitochondria right below levels of potential transmission of serious disease. Obviously, as we develop that pathway, again, there's the complexities of, again, of a multidisciplinary team where we have our specialist, Jane Stewart, Professor Bobby McFarland, who see them in the next aspect of the clinic, which is the next pathway is for those women who are either deemed suitable for IVF-based techniques, be it egg donation, PGD, or mitochondrial donation, go to the next part of the clinic around decision-making, counseling, pre-pregnancy advice, and obstetric support. It's at this stage, any woman who opts for and are appropriate for mitochondrial donation, an application is made to the HFAA, which is our regulatory framework for mitochondrial donation. We help support that application. I myself, along with um, Sister Catherine Freeney, work with Jane and do a lot of work in that. And again, um, there has been an, a significant amount of work that's had to be required because um, you have to provide evidence, not just about the seriousness of disease, that P PGD is not appropriate. Remember, a lot of these women have been waiting and perhaps are older when they're coming to this pathway. It's not necessarily that we push everybody through PGD first. So what we've had to do is actually do quite a lot of scientific rigor in the background, providing evidence in certain mutations that perhaps in the past were always thought that were homoplasmic, meaning that you contained only faulty copies in all the mitochondria but actually for some common conditions, including Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, we have found patients where it's heteroplasmic, so it's not fully homoplasmic, and significant work has had to be done to provide the case to the HFEA that this couple would be best um, and appropriate for mitochondrial donation. Uh, not only is the pathway for the patient uh, um, and the couple, but there's a donor pathway. And this in itself is new for us and for the United Kingdom, but internationally, there had to be a devised a pathway for women who would altruistically come along and provide their eggs. There's a screening process, and that in itself um, has required significant rigor um, uh, to implement within the NHS. And then we've devised a stringent pathway of pregnancy care. As I said to you, these women themselves are often affected by mitochondrial disease, and if not, at potential increased risk of things such as preeclampsia and gestational diabetes to require close monitoring. And then there's that support of what is best. You know, if you harbor certain mutations, it's appropriate that you have a vaginal delivery or a C-section more appropriate. And we've worked very closely with our obstetric colleagues throughout every aspect of that care pathway. For the children potentially born from mitochondrial donation, again, we've had to devise a rigorous pathway of, of following these children up because this is experimental. This is technically, this is first in man. And whilst other areas and other countries have devised or had implemented mitochondrial donation, uh, we were extremely cognizant that it must be an extremely regulated framework, but also speaking and working with our patients and working with our charitable organizations. What every mother said is they did not want their children medicalized. So we've effectively implemented a pathway within our current framework of, um, of developmental milestones for children. And really, as you see, the dark blue are the only two additional things we've added in. One where we check potentially um, if there's been any carryover of that faulty gene, as I say, we've tried to reduce and implementing um, an additional uh, rigorous assessment at 18 months. So what I hope I've shown you in this short presentation is our odyssey since the implementation of legislative change. Um, I think you think we, you know, it takes, you know, it technically took um, 15 years to implement change within the United Kingdom. 
but since then a lot of work has gone on in the background to make sure that we've effectively implemented a safe pathway but also to ensure that it's not just around mitochondrial donation it's making sure that couples are fully informed of all of their potential options i'd like to stop there thank you very much <laughs>